All right, so let's, uh, today, uh, let's uh, move to the first lecture. It's a very short introduction to search for robotics, what it is, what exactly we'll be doing, and the evolution of surgical robotics over time. So here is what some people call the first surgical robot. I wouldn't call that a robot because there is nothing moving there, but that's what is considered to be the first medical robot. It's basically a system that helps the surgeon guide a biopsy needle into a specific area in the brain. They have these attachments around the skull. We find uh, regions in the brain that, are, that are have a suspicious lesion, for example, we want to insert a needle there to sample the tissue, take a small sample out, and then evaluate that histologically. So here I have a biopsy needle that is used for that purpose. The idea is, again, you identify these targets using some sort of imaging method, and then you, in, you insert these long needles through a hole in the skull there, and once the needle is placed in the tumor or in the lesion, what happens is that you have a gun here that it will make the stylet of the needle come out, and there is some sort of um, notch here that, uh, that uh, where now the, the tissue goes in and then this comes back out. So when it comes back out, it takes the tissue sample uh, from the inside. As it goes in and out very fast with, with a spring-loaded gun, and when it comes out, then you have some tissue. That tissue is taken out of the patient and then is evaluated histologically. So that's the purpose of these robots from 1908. And we call these uh, types of surgery, image-guided surgeries using needles like that, stereotactic surgery. But what we are going to be, that's more for information, because what we are going to be focused on is laparoscopic surgery. Who has heard of laparoscopic surgery before? Some, some people. So traditionally, the way you do surgery is that you simply open up the patient, and then you have access to the internal organs or whatever you need to operate on. But instead of doing that, instead of open surgery, now the trend is to use laparoscopic surgery. We use a small, we make a small holes in the patient, and then we insert the tools through that. So I borrowed here a few tools from Miles' uh, capstone project. He's working on that, and these are the tools we um, use in laparoscopic. I'll pass them around. So they are thin, very thin and you have some sort of handle or gripper at the, at the tip or something to cut the tissue, so insert them through these small holes and it can manipulate the tissue from the outside. Now you may wonder, well, how do I see what is inside the patient? Well, insert another one of these with a camera at the tip. We don't have that because that costs a few thousand, uh, several thousand dollars. How does, it, how does the camera get dirty? It does. The, ca the camera does get dirty. But you position the camera in a way that you can flush it with another instrument. Right, so there are there are several constraints. I'll pass some of these around. We'll start from here. So this is um, minimally invasive. Surgery. It is minimally invasive. Yeah. So we have these tools. We call these the, uh, the these laparoscopic tools. Typically, we have two incisions. One for each tool, so you can have a bimanual operation. And then you have a third incision where the camera, the laparoscope, goes in with a camera at the tip. To make things easier uh, for the surgeon, but not for the patient, sometimes the patient is inflated with some gas, so you have a, a better workspace to work. So this has been, uh, been around for quite some time, and the role of contemporary surgical robots is to replace the surgeon in these types of procedures and add a robot to do it. And you may wonder, well, why would I put a robot there? Because now I put a robot just to control that robot remotely with joysticks. Now, instead of holding this tool directly, I'm holding a joystick that connects to the robot, that holds the tools that operate on the patient. Seems like a lot of complications for no reason, just to achieve the same result. Well, not really. Because now with a robot arm, we can make motion much more precise. For example, when the, the surgeon manipulates the joysticks and moves the joysticks by, let's say, 10 centimeters, we can program the robots to move by one millimeter. So making the procedure 
a lot more precise than you would otherwise achieve manually. If the surgeon is not having a good day, is shaking a little bit, what you can do is that you take the position of the joysticks, we pass that through a low pass filter, and then pass the filtered position to the robot. So the robot will filter out the tremors, and once again, uh, the accuracy will improve. Right, so there are several advantages to robotic surgery. So in the context of this course, when we talk about robotic surgery, we are talking about laparoscopic surgery using robot arms to use to control them. So here is the actual first laparoscopic robot. That's the uh, something came in uh, 1985 and was used to guide these exact needles that you you, you have there for biopsy. So the needle goes at the tip of the robot. We take CT scans, real-time CT scans. We identify the lesion in the CT scan. And then the robot inserts the needle, the needle percutaneously through the skin up to the point where the lesion is uh, visible in the images. Then you check in the images if the needle is positioned where it should be. And then you take the sample and take it out. So this is a uh, one, two, three degrees of freedom one, two, three, four degrees of freedom robot, and the robot, w the, the, then the needle would be attached to its tip. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that these robots are not operating on their own. They are being controlled remotely. So again, you're not replacing the role of the surgeon. We are just letting the robot mimic their motion with higher accuracy and precision. Here's another type moving on. That was in 85, this is in 81, 91. This is a robot meant for orthopedic surgery. You can think about a hip replacement, for example, or any type of um, bone surgery. For example, if you have a joint that is needs to be replaced, the way it is typically done, it is cut off, and then you drill into the, uh, the bone and you put a replacement part that is made of a special material. But that special attachment is, re is replacing the bone and it is is screwed inside the bone. So the first step towards that is to, of course, take out the part that you want to replace and then drill a hole in the bone where that will be connected. So the idea of this robot is simply to hold the drill and then help the surgeon achieve a uh, more precise shape of that uh, drilling area. Now, if you do it by hand, here is one example. But what you want to achieve is that. So what you do is that you take, again, images of the patient. You position the, the, the leg or the bone that you need to drill in. And these shapes now are programmed in the robot. The robot is not doing the job itself. It's simply limiting the motion within that region. So you cannot deviate from it. And you can drill. Yeah. Is, does this still fall under uh, laparoscopic uh, devices? This would not. This one will not be laparoscopic. This is a special case. Uh, and then you can see that the shape we achieved at the end there is a lot more consistent than the one done by hand. Uh, so this has been around for a few years now. Now we are converging more towards uh, what we see today when you think about surgical robots. People typically think about the Da Vinci surgical system. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. Right, so this is the one that preceded Da Vinci. There was an independent company that was bought by them. This is the uh, this is looking more like a robot that we would use today. So you see two different pieces here. The first one is the robot itself that operates on the patient. We have robot arms with these laparoscopic tools that are passing around attached to the tip or some special version of it. And then on the left, is that the left? On the right? We have the console where the surgeon sits and then manipulates these tools remotely. You also see a screen there, and the screen is basically streaming the other uh, webcam that is inside the patient. Right. So now we have a dual teleoperation system. Each of these arms, you move them, and then the robots on the other side will mimic that motion. Right. So the console on the, uh, what is this again? The right is is it yeah is basically 
mim a, 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 a model of the tools on the left. And as you move the grippers and you move the handles, the robot simply mimics. Now the link, the physical link between the surgeon and the patient is broken. You can no longer feel the forces that are applying to the tissue, so that's the downside. We'll see how to fix that in a bit. All right, but that is removed. Now you're simply manipulating passive handles, and then on the other side, we have a robot operating on a patient. So you have no, the feeling of touching, touching the tissue is basically gone. Yes? Is there any delay from the operation? Well, yes, so delay could be, would be an important factor. Because if your actions are delayed, the system can simply go unstable. Here, if it is a local teleoperational network, the delay is negligible. It still exists, but is negligible. If you consider a long distance teleoperational network, then the delay would limit the, uh, the applicability. But we'll see later that it's, it's doable. So the first uh, application, so this was first tested in Android 96 and then I8, where they did the first surgery. So it's been, uh, been, been around for over 20 years. It's nothing new there. In 2003, it was marketed nearly at, uh, at $1 million. That's a bit of an expensive side for medical equipment. Anything that has a medical tag on it, the price simply <laughs> explodes. There is one, um, one of these lap, uh, laparoscopic tools that is moving around. The, uh, the one that is metal. Yeah. That one, I think is, that one is around $3,000. Yeah. Wow. All right, so you asked me about delay. So here's an example where delay can be eliminated. So this is the Lindenberg operation that was done in 2001 using that system. It was for the removal of the, the, uh, the gall uh, bladder and the... the uh, Interesting thing about this is that the surgeon was in New York and the patient was in Strasbourg, France. I don't know what, what the need was for them, probably just to show off that they could do it, but we, it, it is possible to do it uh, remotely. This needed a dedicated optical fiber or a dedicated communication network with the, the site in, in France. And that's the only reason it could be done remotely. Now you had the physical channel that it was reserved for this operation at that time. And then the entire procedure in 2001 could, was done remotely from New York to Strasbourg. So now moving on, this is the modern Da Vinci surgical system. We have several robot arms, and we have on the other side there the console where the surgeon sits. So the surgeon is basically putting their arms here, grasping these handles, and then putting the head in the uh, some sort of uh, virtual reality set there, where he sees or uh, she sees the uh, image that is captured from the uh, lapras the lapras right. So this is the robot that positioned on the patient, the console. And that is the uh, control system. So most, well, this is mostly used today for heart surgery and for uh, laparoscopic procedures. And again, uh, heart surgery done in the same manner as a laparoscopic procedure. Instead of opening up the chest, simply have small incisions that uh, allow the stools to go through. So these are the components of the surgical robot. We have the robot arm itself, and you identify some of the, the grippers that you see here. Some of them have more degrees of freedom than that one. That one is basically just open and close. Some of them we can rotate the tip, you can move on an angle, and so on. But so those are attached to the tip, the tip of the robot arm. Now these robot arms, they are typically redundant meaning that they have more degrees of freedom than you need to control the position or, 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 and orientation of a tool. Now, you only need six degrees of freedom, six joints, to be able to control position and orientation of anything. These robots typically have more than that, so that you can achieve a better control and be better dexterity of what you're manipulating. 
the next uh, element here is the surgeon's console. The surgeon basically sits on it. You can see the post here and is manipulating this tool, these handles, and then the handles control the robot uh, remotely. And then there's also paddles you can, you can press to do some special program. Professor, yeah. could you please explain again about the degree of freedom? Yes, so if you have a robot with six joints, you can control position and orientation of the robot's tip. So it depends on the, how many joints you have? With six, you control everything. But they add more, so you can achieve the same position and orientation with different configurations of the robot. Right, so. An example is with your arm. If I put my arm here, I can put my arm, my hand here in different positions. Right? Yes. I have more degrees of freedom to control than uh, more degrees of freedom than what I am trying to control, the position and orientation of my hand. The robot arm does the same. It has more degrees of freedom than it needs to be able to orient and position itself. So you can achieve those positions with different configurations with more flexibility. And then at the tip we have tools here and this is what I call the port. That's where the tools are inserted in the tissue. So the degree of freedom is controlled by two joysticks. Yes. The only controlled by two joysticks. So the way it works is depending on the paddle they press, they, they they do one arm or another arm, but you can only control two arms at a time. We'll do something in the labs. The robots we have are six degrees of freedom, but the joysticks we have are only three degrees of freedom. Then the, con the question is, how do you actually control something that has six degrees of freedom with only three degrees of freedom? Like use two joysticks with one arm? Well, one, one, one joystick per arm. So what you're going to do in the lab is that it will make sure that the robot ensures that the tool here, the, the, uh, this tool, let's say this is the entry point, the robot holds it, and all, it makes sure that it passes through the entry point. So that's the robot's job, is constraining the tool to pass through the entry point. And you as an operator will control the position of the tip. So if I move the joystick left or right, you're now controlling left or right here. And the robot is making sure that you are always passing through the same point. Otherwise, the robot will just do this, right? But now it's doing this and that. And we'll program it. <clears throat> we'll see how to program it in lab 7 and 8. Yeah? So it can you still go deep? Like once you pass through the point, can you still go deeper if you need to? Yes, we can. We can control the robot to 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 do that. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, depending on the depth that you are, we know where this constraint point is along the shaft, and then you tell the robot make sure that that point of the shaft is at this specific position all the time. We'll do that in one. I don't know why this is not displaying, but you have a better copy on a better view there. But basically, this is just that a picture of the Da Vinci system again. It's my iPad acting. I have basically two main components: the console on one side, and then the uh, the robot on the other side. And how to visualize the tools? There was supposed to be a picture there with a laparoscope and a tool coming out of it. You can see that on your uh, copy if you downloaded it. Unfortunately, it's not displayed here. Another type of surgical robot is simply the ones that will magnify or uh, down, scale the motion of the surgeon down. So here we have one where the robot and the surgeon operate on the same site, like that uh, uh, orthopedic drill we saw in the beginning. And the surgeon is holding the robot directly, and the robot is then controlling, amplifying the motion, downscaling the motion, filtering out tremors, and so on. And this for more micro surgery. So we are going to have an articulated robot arm. First question is how they operate. The one we have looks like this. It has six degrees of freedom. Each degree of freedom is actuated by a motor. Moves independently. Each motor is has a position sensor. An encoder. So if you know now the the angle of each of these joints and you know how they are connected we should be able to infer the position of the end effector that's called the kinematics of the robot forward and inverse kinematics forward kinematics meaning that if i know 
where all these joints are, where is the tip. Inverse kinematic says, if I want the tip to go to a given position, what are the required angles in each of the joints? The forward problem is simple, the inverse problem not so much. Right. So I have lectures about that. So this is how it works. Uh, sensors typically uh, encoders and uh, an actuator and then the base of the robot. So, right. so the angular position is typically what we measure. Now and the position of the end effector is then inferred from them. So the sensors are not at the tip of the robot, the sensors are distributed across the joints. So here we see a better view of what the surgeon sees. So that's the console. The surgeon is sitting here, putting her head there. And that's the view they have from the camera. Well, as you can imagine, this procedure is much harder than open surgery. Because in open surgery, you can coordinate the tools easily. Or whatever you move, in the direction you move, the tools will just follow. Now this is reversed if you move your tool you have, the tool, you have to move the, through, the, the tool through an entry point, and you have, depending on the angle of the camera, your motion will be reversed. Right, so it's a much more complicated task. So basically, we have now a two-dimensional view of a three-dimensional problem to operate on, which complicates the, the procedure even more. Yeah, the, as you said, the controls are inverse from a human uh, operating. <coughs> because for this one, for example, I think if you want to move the tool down, you need to move your hand up. Uh, you would move your hand down. It, 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 well, no, I mean, if there's one point of entry. If it is one point, yeah. yeah. So if I want to move toward me, I'll have to push this away. Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. 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 I don't just use two cameras. You, that's the advantage of the, this. You could use two cameras and create a three-dimensional view of what you are. And some, some some robots do it now. Yeah. yeah. What are they operating on? That's the question. That I have no idea. Uh, it's always a bit disgusting. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. But uh, so you can then. Uh, now, if the motion is reversed, you can undo that in the robot system. I can make it more intuitive. That's another advantage. So here is the console where they grab the, the, uh, the, the controller. So you see grippers. So the grippers will do the same function as the grippers you see here. Same, same idea. And then they have six degrees of freedom. You can control orientation and position. So you see the orientation is controlled by these three degrees of freedom here, and then uh, moving on up and down, left and right, that gives you the extra partition degrees of control. Okay. So most of the time, these, you, these uh, consoles are passive, meaning that they only have sensors. They don't do anything other than measuring the position. And when they do that, then your sense of touching the, 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 the tissue is lost because you're manipulating a completely passive system. There are ways to restore that motion, that, uh, that, a, set, that, a, that a feeling of touching something. Today, surgical robots are not equipped with that, but we are moving towards it. There's some research on it, that's the field of my research in the lab. If you're interested, you can talk about it. You can, uh, in fourth year, you can do a master's on it, if you like. How do we actually restore this sense of touching the tissue. So the answer is relatively simple. We are taking these joysticks that were passive and you are now equipping them with motors. And whenever the tool on one side touches the tissue and you measure a force, we can make the device on this side here display that force to the surgeon, apply that force to the surgeon. So if I have a robot touching a wall and I measure the contact against that wall, when I move it towards the wall, I won't be able to move past that wall because there's a force applied to my hand in the opposite direction. So, right, that's, yeah. so it's past the same gain, or it, the, the machine will add more gain to the... Operation. It's up to us. We can have the exact same amount of force, 
or you can scale that force up and down. For example, we can measure forces that are at the millinewton level when you're manipulating very sensitive structures, and you can scale that up to be one newton and a surgeon's hand. Right? So that gives you that amplification of forces. Yeah? What about, like, you know, so you're putting these forces when you're Feel it, but then what, how do you like make sure you don't squish something too hard or whatever? When you're, can you like add a stop? Can you, like, you can add the hard stops. You yeah. can also now have a zone around when you know, in which you can operate, and if you deviate from that, you create some sort of virtual wall right. that you can't pass. Right. You can also have um, a limit in grasping force, for example, if the grasping force is greater than a certain threshold, you simply don't move anymore, stop the, the, the robot motion. So you have the freedom to do all of that. In surgical robots today, that feature is not available. The systems are still all passive, and we are working towards bringing that sense of touch back. Which is a big problem, because now you have no way to tell if you're ripping apart the, the tissue. Right? You're, only do, you're doing everything based on images, and you can't really tell how much force you're exerting on the tissue. So the addition of haptic or force feedback would mitigate that, yeah? Is there any way to tell what kind of tissue you're touching based on the forces experienced when you touch it? Depending on how refined the haptic feedback force is, yes. Yeah. Are you specifically doing research into haptic feedback for surgical robotics or just more generally? In general, okay. but also a big component of it is for surgical robotics. If you guys are, uh, we'll do a lab tour one day, uh, but if you are around canal building in the sixth floor, Go bother Alec, 6110, uh, and he can show you a surgical simulator where you have these, uh, these functions implemented. The simulator is for percutaneous nephrolithotomy. That's a procedure to remove kidney stones. You take a big tool like that and put that on the patient's back in the kidney. And it's a relatively complicated procedure to learn. So we have a simulator in the lab that uh, uh, was developed by a company that uh, is used to teach surgeons how to operate and this haptic feedback implement. Okay, so whenever you are around an canal building, uh, come see me or go to Alec and he can give you a demo. Of that. So what do you mean by that? Okay, so let's go through. So one difference here between this console and the robots, they're not identical. The robots have uh, typically a very high gear ratio, and once you leave them alone, you can't move them. If you power them off, you can't really physically move them, most of them. These ones are the opposite because they are meant to be moved by the operator. Right, so they typically don't have gear ratios. They have some transmissions like that. It's a cable transmission. And they are back drivable. That means that if you, you can move it by hand, back and forth. And they can apply a force to your hand. Right. So the forces that we experience when... I'll take your question. Are coming from two sources. Are coming from the forces that we program that these devices apply to the operator, but are also coming from the inertia and friction that are inherent to these things. Ideally, they would have no inertia, no friction, no mass, so we wouldn't feel the forces of the device itself. All right, so that's another challenge in developing the system, is that they should be what you call transparent. They should not be visible if they are not uh, displaying force. Are you only working with force haptic feedback or any other? We are also doing tactile feedback. Haptic uh, force feedback like this, and then tactile like a, vibe, um, and a phone vibrates, for example. And we apply that to different types of uh, surgeons. The Capcom project this year, developing a tool, uh, it's some sort of uh, tool that interacts with a virtual environment. So you hold it, uh, the virtual environment follows your motion, and whenever you touch the tissue, it will stretch your fingertips so you kind of feel a torque applied to your fingertips. That's the idea behind it. It's another type of haptic feedback. Any, any other questions? No? So we covered this passive, active devices, those that don't provide force feedback, those that have force feedback. This is the one that you're going to use mystery remains because the picture is not shown. All right. uh, this is the one we uh, are going to get in the lab soon. These are the same ones used to control the Canada arm in the International Space Station. 
have two, two of those coming in soon for a reason. So here is the most basic control architecture we can think of for these procedures. We have the haptic device here. We are measuring all for all the angles. Through that uh, measurement, you can infer where the tip is and how it is oriented, how your hand is oriented and where it is. We scale that through a gain, multiply that, scale that up or, or down, pass that through a low pass filter so tremors are eliminated. Now, at the end of that low pass filter, we have a desired position. We have the filter desired position and orientation of your hand. And are going to give that to the robot and make the robot go to that position. So now it becomes a control problem. We have a desired position that comes from here, and you want the robot to go to that desired position. How do we do that? PID controllers. We're using a PD here, it's simpler to implement. We're basically taking the desired position, measuring the actual position of now the robot arm itself on the robot side, and then making sure that the robot goes to that position, create a position error, send that to the PID controller. The output here is a torque applied to each of the uh, joints in the robot arm. The robot moves, and as it moves, the angles will change, the forward kinematics will give the current position of the tip, and then the loop repeats until the robot settles at the position of the arm. That happens very fast. I mean, it's a matter of milliseconds if everything works properly. One thing that can complicate everything here is that this line may have some delay. And if your action is delayed, your, your, what is happening, your vision is delayed from your action, you can imagine that is a good recipe for a disaster. Uh, you're trying to correct for something that is going to happen that hasn't even happened. But that is the, would be the most basic control architecture. So some applications that you see here, we'll discuss this one, uh, gallbladder removal, instead of having an open surgery and you see on the uh, right, we have now the incisions of two surgical tools and a uh, laparoscope. And those then, the, the robot would come on top of that to control. Will the gallbladder still fit through the hole or how do they take it out? They can cut it in small pieces and suck it out through a tube. Another one that's quite interesting is artery bypass. So when you have part of the, the, the heart that is blocked, that it doesn't receive uh, blood, you can actually attach a vein to it and then uh, bypass that blockage. So it, you, you, you take a, a donor vein from somewhere else in the body and then you simply attach that from one part of the heart that supplies the blood to the part just below the blood. That is typically done with open heart surgery so that the Cut the chest open, you stop the heart, connect the uh, patient to a, a lung machine that will make everything, uh, uh, make everything work, and then operate on that. But instead, we can also do it laparoscopically. Now, four tools here, two arms are typically used, a third one just in case, and then the laparoscopic tool. So instead of spending three to six months, uh, taking three to six months to recover with an open heart, this would go down to two to four weeks. As you can see the advantages of not having your chest open and a few incisions to do that instead. Hip replacement, we talked about this one when you talked about orthopedic surgery. This is a bit different right, because now the robot here, uh, the, the surgeon is, op, uh, is holding the operating robot directly. Right, and now the robot is simply limiting the motion or filtering the motion of the, the, the surgeon directly there. Right? So we can control this, create these virtual zones where the robot cannot move, so the surgeon cannot deviate from that, but the surgeon is still in full control of the procedure. Some research now will be done where we are trying to remove the surgeon from the loop and let the robot do it itself. I was working with a company from Toronto, they do the one that developed that after 10 years, the nephrolithotomy uh, robot. And you're investigating the possibility of having a robot train a robot to do the procedure instead of a surgeon. Right? That's a 
it was a master's project, now it became a PhD project. <clears throat> Here's another one, a better view of what we're talking about. His, 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 uh, his terectomy is the removal of the uterus through this surgical tools again. It's partitioning and taking it out slowly. So you see all the, the, the tools being uh, inserted and you see how the patient is a bit inflated. That's because gas is injected inside so there's a better visibility. Or, or, or. I hope you're not too sensitive to these images. This is a reminder the class is called surgical robotics, so it's kind of expected. Yeah. Yeah. You would see something like that. Um, do they use a specific type of gas to do the inflation, or is it just general? Risk? I think it's just a general. Yeah. And then how it gets out, so uh, you can imagine. Kidney removal is another one where either the entire kidney is removed or just a part of part of it is sliced, and then the uh, suture around the that, that, that part. Here we have clearly a lesion that has been taken out through a laparoscopic procedure. Mitral valve repair. This is when the valve in the heart is not operating properly, not fully opening or fully closing, creating some circulation issues. And either portion of it is removed and then uh, sutured as you see there. So again, this is all done using uh, laparoscopic intervention. You would need to fully open the chest to have access to them. Okay. You see the tools and you see the uh, laparoscopic tool there. Other types of applications, can you guys, you guys any, know anything else that can be done with that? Can you think of any other application? Here's a list, but can you think of anything else? Have you heard of any other types of surgical applications? I had a cystectomy done laparoscopically. Which is? So it's the removal of a cyst. Mine was on my ovary, but other ones occur all throughout the body. Anybody else? Uh, you can remove the appendix as well. It's a small point. Mm -hmm. Uh, neurological surgery, for example, is another one. Uh, did you have uh, any other things? Yeah. Uh, I had my other ones uh, moved. Uh, with laparoscopic, with, yeah. with the robot, or just? Uh, just, yeah. just no. With the uh, like the doctor did. Yeah. Moving on. I had my meniscus also repaired. Uh, I understand why all of you you are here now. <laughs> 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 it's a, a do it yourself at home. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm not asking if you on the right procedure. For the, you know. <laughs> no, but well, here's a list. I have another one booked for the summer. It's like, uh, okay. Could, could we do it in the lab instead? <laughs> I wouldn't take that risk, no. <laughs> so here's another, uh, it's a list of everything, uh, and there's more to it as well. Oh, but um, with uh, this technology, could surgeons perform on themselves? I don't think so. <laughs> it, it, it depends. If you were yeah. able to do it so that they could do it with local anesthesia, low enough down on the spine that they could still yeah. control their arms. Yeah, probably not recommended. Not yeah. Yeah. So what are the advantages of this? Well, clearly small incisions are better than larger ones. Reduce post-surgery pain, blood lo uh, loss. Uh, smaller scars, more precision with robots, robots than by hand. Uh, and shorter hospital stays mean also means less costs for the health system. Now the downside of it is the cost of a surgical robotic system is definitely over a million dollars, um, nearing two million for some systems. Yeah. The risk. Uh, the, 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 the robots are relatively safe to operate on. Uh, they, they go through a procedure, a validation procedure, where they are, there is some software safety extra added to it. So they are relatively, relatively safe to use. Yeah. What about procedure time, when compared to regular procedure? Uh, procedure time. Time? Like, do they, actually, do they take longer right now? I, I think they would probably take a little longer because you have to set up the whole system. 
sterilize everything. But I, I wouldn't. I think the advantage is not really in saving time; is more in increasing precision in, in motion. Yeah. How long does it take to train a surgeon to actually use the machine? That's a very good point. It takes. It depends on the procedure. For example, for percutaneous nephrotomy, they would need to perform that procedure 130 times on a patient before they actually become proficient. And there's a big leap between laparoscopic surgery done by hand and the one done robotically. Surgeons that excel in manual lapar laparoscopy may not perform well uh, initially in a robotic setting. And there, there is a learning curve. It strongly depends on the procedure. You, you, you are performing a nephrolithotomy, for example, go to the lab, take a look at it. It's a particularly tricky one, and it takes around 130 uh, procedures to get proficient at it, so you understand the need for these types of simulators. Before the surgeons go into the operating room, they will be operating on training models. Right, so it's, more, it's a box with holes in it, pass the, the, the tools through, and uh, Bias can, can give you more details on that. That's his uh, capstone projects developing a training a tool for uh, pediatric surgery using laparoscopic tools. So the, the training is a big component of it, and it also, also, of course, adds the cost of operating them. So, to implement a surgical robot ourselves, what do we need to know? Well, we need to understand how robots work. So that's the first part of the class. We went over that. We need to understand how these surgical consoles work, how haptics works. And then we need to understand how... Uh, we link everything together with the specifics of each application. That's the last part. All right, so three main parts in the class. Up to lecture 10 is all about, so lectures 2 to 10, so that's nine lectures, is all about robotics. And then from there on, we move to haptics and then applications of surgeries. As we go through these, you'll get a better idea of what we can propose for your project. Uh, and in the labs, uh, Alec will give you a demo. We'll have a better idea of how the the um, the robots are soon. So this is a typical robot arm. One question that we have to answer, for example, and that's why we need to go through the robotics theory, is what is the orientation of the tool given the given the angles of the links of the robot, or the other way around. If you want the tool to go to a certain position, what angles should we give to each of the arms uh, or the joints? So before we can do anything, we need to be able to answer those questions. That's the robotics kinematics that is going to start on uh, Thursday. Is that Thursday's next lecture? Yes. Yeah. Where is Tuesday? Yeah. Uh, another question here is if you have a tool like that, if you change the, the angle of one uh, joint by a few, a few uh, degrees, how does that affect the position? All of this needs to be extremely clear before we can attempt to do anything. Now, this is what we are going to use. We have a robot arm and a haptic device. Now, this robot arm looks like a little toy, but it's not. That robot arm costs around $20,000. It is the most precise robot arm you can get. It has an accuracy of 5 micrometers. That's a, a quarter of a hair, to give you an idea. Right. So, it's, it's extremely precise, and you have access to eight of those. Those are your responsibility to take care of. We'll be given them in in the labs. We'll take uh, eight stations, and then you eventually will add the haptic device later. That's the one we are getting. It's from a company from Montreal. That's around ten thousand dollars each. So your setup, as it stands, is around thirty. That's a conservative estimate. And then we can add grippers and other per peripherals to the robot. The grippers are also provided. They just open and close have access to that. What we want to implement eventually in the lab is to give you, again, all, you all the tools to be able to control this guy through that right, and perform some uh, uh, some sort of uh, search. So first lab, in the first lab, Alec will give you a, more, a better introduction to that. And then the first lab activity scheduled for next week will get uh, used to the robot commands, how we make it move. Uh, how do we interface it with a computer, 
and so on. And then you're going to slowly add to that up to the point where you're now able to move the haptic device and the robot will mimic your motion as in a uh, actual surgery.